pride in the newsroom. This week was supposed to be all about Vilnius, the capital of Lithuania, where a European Union Eastern Partnership Summit will open on Thursday. Ukraine was to be the big star as it sealed loans and closer trading ties with Brussels. That is, until Russia made a more convincing offer, or as some put it, one that Kiev couldn't refuse. A diplomatic flurry that included a secret meeting earlier this month between Vladimir Putin and his Ukrainian counterpart, leading to last week's stunning reversal on the part of Viktor Yanukovych. There you see Putin in the company of the Pope. He's in Italy right now. We'll hear from him later. Now, Yanukovych's reversal has prompted the biggest demonstrations in Ukraine since the pro-Western Orange Revolution of 2004. The opposition branding the Russian-speaking president as a sellout. But is it that clear-cut? We'll see why relations between the Ukrainian president and Moscow had uh, deteriorated over past years. And ask our panel if uh, could this be the least worst option for a hard-up country still heavily dependent on its neighbor to the east for trade and for fuel. We'll also ask where it leaves Brussels and its policies looking east. After Russia's 2008 war with Georgia, Moscow has once again, it seems, staked out its turf. The Iron Curtain may be gone for good, but could Europe now be headed for another East versus West deep freeze in relations? Today in the France 24 debate, Putin's hard bargain. And with us to talk about it from Kiev, Alexei Plotnikov. He's the head of the European Center for a Modern Ukraine. Thank you for joining the France 24 Hello. debate. Hello. Good evening. From Moscow, former member of parliament for Vladimir Putin's United Russia party, Sergei Markov, director of the Institute of Political Studies. Welcome back to the show, sir. Thank you. Hello. Celestine Bone, columnist at the International New York Times. How are you? Fine. Thank you very much. And uh, Florent Parmentier, who teaches at the French Political Science Institute, Sciences Po. Thank you for joining us, the France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation on Facebook and on Twitter. Our hashtag, F24Debate. Before we go to our panel, let's go to Ukraine's capital and uh, correspondent Gulliver Craig. Gulliver, uh, the opposition staging another rally this evening. Yes, this is uh, the sixth evening of demonstrations. And I think that there are as many people as there were yesterday on Europe Square, um, but that's only a few thousand people, far less than the huge crowds that we saw on uh, Sunday when the organizers say that there were at least 100,000 people. Of course, uh, the authorities and uh, the Ukrainian prime minister who I spoke to today are saying that it was somewhat less than that, but certainly it was tens of thousands of people. The demonstrators have kept up the momentum, but things have changed a little bit in the shape of the demonstrations. When the announcement was first made that Ukraine would not sign this agreement, there was a spontaneous protest on Independence Square. There, those people who protested on Independence Square have been maintaining a presence since then, um, but their numbers are, well, dwindling, but still, I would say they're in the thousands. Meanwhile, the main opposition party set up a stage on Europe Square and have every evening had the main leaders of the opposition parties giving speeches, but there does seem to be something of a division between the sort of official uh, political opposition and the grassroots movement that's an independent square and which has banned party flags. Ah, interesting. So there are uh, uh, two, different, uh, uh, two different trends among those who uh, are protesting for uh, signing on to that deal with the U U European Union. Gulliver Absolutely. mentioning there the, the momentum. Uh, Gulliver, stay with us because I want you to hear what the daughter of jailed former Ukraine Prime Minister Yulia Timoshenko said at the weekend amid those demonstrations. This current situation means that now we need to thoroughly finish what was done by the Orange Revolution in 2004. Of course, from what you're saying, Gulliver, the crowds are not as massive as in 2004. Now, as well, you attended a press conference earlier, Gulliver, where the prime minister spoke openly about the deal struck with Moscow. Just about the size of the crowds, I might mention that Yuli Tymoshenko's lawyer, Sergei Vlasenko, reminded me when I spoke to him yesterday that in 2004, there were also evenings when there were only a few hundred or a few thousand people, and it took you know, many, many days and weeks of demonstrations to build up to the huge crowds that we all remember. So he's still optimistic that this uh, movement can continue. But yes, uh, Mikola Azarov today, um, well, he wouldn't be drawn on exactly how much money Russia had promised to Ukraine or exactly what form it would take. But when journalists were pressing about that, he said, 
look, I hope it's a lot. And then he laughed. The Ukrainian authorities aren't making uh, any uh, secret of the fact that Russia has offered to help them. And Mykola Azarov was critical of the IMF and the European Union for not uh, offering money to help uh, Ukraine. The IMF has uh, said that the loans to Ukraine will be conditional on uh, its reducing subsidies for um, domestic gas consumers, um, which uh, the Ukrainian authorities say is completely unfair to mm. poor Ukrainians. Others might say that it's unfair to those who are taking money from that correctly. Okay, so and Mikola Azarov said the EU should compensate Ukraine for the loss of Russian markets. Okay, so more pressure on, on the EU than, uh, than on Moscow. Uh, uh, thanks, Gulliver Craig, for, for joining us there from Kiev. Let me get, before we go back to Kiev and, and, and Alexei Plonitkov, let me, uh, let me ask you, Florent Parmentier, mm -hmm. um, are you surprised the way things are unfolding and hearing that the prime minister there more critical of the EU than, than of Moscow? Yeah, I think that um, the fact that uh, Ukraine suspended its negotiation with, with the EU was a total surprise for everybody, I would say even for a very good connoisseur of the country. Uh, I think about uh, Mr. Kwasniewski was very much involved in the negotiation. Uh, I don't think that he, he expected that. And the way now uh, things are going actually um, is, has more to deal with the way um, Ukrainian authorities will uh, try to uh, contain um, the hunger of uh, a part of the population, which... Uh, uh, when you say the hunger, what do you mean? The hunger, I mean that for lots of Ukrainians, I think about the youth, I think about um, many people in the capital uh, that really wanted um, to sign the deal with the European Union. Um, this is seen as something such as a betrayal. I mean, the term is a bit strong, but um, uh, given the expectation and given the fact that it was at the very last moment that uh, Ukraine um, did not make the deal, then um, it is seen as Ukraine as um, probably a sign of power, a sign of weakness more than power. The fact that in the end, you know, you promise something and then you go back to your promise. That's something which doesn't seem very, um, I mean, with which uh, public opinion maybe is not so favorable to this kind of behavior. Uh, Alexei Plotnikov, uh, did, yes. uh, in your view, the president strike a better bargain or uh, did he show weakness as uh, as Alma was just saying? Uh, first of all, the, we don't have a protest against government solution. I think it's uh, activity in support of uh, European integration of uh, our country. I think it's uh, very important for Ukraine, the understanding in uh, population that uh, we need in Europe, that our way is Europe, that Euro integration is the main way for our future. It's my first remark. And uh, especially for a solution of uh, Mr. Azarov, of our prime minister, the main reason of this solution is uh, economical reason. If I know we have a problem with export to Russian Federation, we have uh, uh, export uh, diminished by uh, 4.2 uh, billion dollars uh, in, uh, during the uh, last six months, and after uh, forecast of uh, Ukrainian sources on the uh, end of this year, uh, we uh, forecast uh, about 8 billion of fall of export. And it's a very great problem for Ukrainian national economy in accordance that the, uh, some uh, enterprises, enterprises of uh, part of Ukraine oriented for uh, marketing uh, Russia and other Swiss countries is not for Europe orientation. But unfortunately, we don't have a normal solution of this problem. We don't have a compensation from uh, EU. And unfortunately, we don't have possibility to continue our talking with uh, Russian Federation about economic situation. Uh, let me just interrupt you on that, Oleksii, because uh uh, the uh, president of Ukraine has been speaking, uh, Viktor Yanukovych, saying Ukraine will consider signing the EU pact when the terms improves. I want to turn to Celestine Bolin here. Um, the bargaining continues even after the bargain's been made, it seems. <clears throat> well, I think that I mean, I think that's right that, you know, Ukraine has been playing both sides against the middle for quite a while since Yanukovych became president. Um, and I think that he sort of succeed, uh, he's succeeded in a way now to get um, money from Russia. 
I think that uh, the European Union is right to not get into this bidding war because at the end of the day, if Ukraine is suffering because of Russia abruptly cut, cut off exports, it hardly seems the role of the European Union to try to make up that difference. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, the message of a lot of this is that, you know, bullying works, first of all. And secondly, um, Ukraine and perhaps even Yanukovych have um, are sort of coming out like a battered wife, you know, who keep getting beat up. Exports were stopped at the summer, and as we just heard, maybe $8 billion by the end of the year. And so into whose arms do they fall when they're feeling really bad? Back into the arms of Russia, who actually delivered this blow. So, I, and I think finally, um, you know, I think one part of the game here is Yanukovych's own political future. He has elections in 2015. And I think he may have actually dealt, sort of double deal dealt himself because now he looks like he's going to get out of the economic hole <clears throat> with Russia, but he has disappointed a large part of his population, and we see them on the streets right now. And that's a disappointment that's actually very profound. I think it's, a, it's not just about covering the dead or it's a, as again, somebody was saying, it's about which way Ukraine wants to be. And I think that, that he may find himself, um, you know, beat up again. But All right. On Monday, he spoke out. Ukraine's president said the decision to deal with Moscow instead of Brussels was a tough one to take. I want there to be peace and tranquility in our big European family. As a father cannot leave his family without a piece of bread, I have no right to leave people to the mercy of fate with all the problems which might emerge because of the pressure we're under now. Production plants will stop and millions of citizens will be thrown out onto the streets. The pressure we're under now. Sergei Markov, did Vladimir Putin bully Viktor Yanukovych into that decision? I think no, it's not Vladimir Putin, that's a reality. No, situation very simple. Uh, Russia and Ukraine uh, now has a free trade zone agreement. Not only by the way Ukraine, not only with Russia, but with Kazakhstan, Belarus and other countries. Uh, UN European Union more strong than uh, Ukraine, and European Union imposed to Ukraine the treaty which gives some benefit to European Union and uh, not so beneficial to Ukraine. Same time, this treaty undermine free trade zone with Russia. Uh, as a result, Ukraine is losing Russian market. But because Ukraine uh, has mostly trade with Russia, but not with uh, uh, European Union, as a result, Ukrainian economy will be in big trouble. If economy will be in trouble, it will be decreasing the standard of living, a lot of unemployment, and uh, as a result, uh, Viktor Yanukovych will be not uh, elected in the uh, 2015. It's absolutely clear. It's very simple. Uh, I think it's a very big mistake from the beginning of Viktor Yanukovych, uh, but also it was a mistake from European Union, who still wants to impose semi-colonial uh, treaty to the neighboring country, but not to have big Europe. Uh, we suggested to European Union to create a real big, Euro big Europe, which will include not only European Union and subordinates to European Union country, but, uh, but we suggested European Union to treat to the such countries like uh, Russia and Ukraine as equal as uh, those who have own interests. And as a result, we will build a uh, big uh, Europe with our suggestion. And I believe that this crisis will teach uh, European uh, politicians that they shouldn't ignore Russia. They, uh, they should not uh, deny Russian interests. So as Ukrainian interests, they should take in account Russian and Ukrainian interests. And they sh uh, we hope that they will be ready for negotiation. As you know, Ukrainian leaders suggested triangle uh, negotiation. It's very reasonable. Look at the European uh, press. Look at uh, the, the French, uh, British, German newspapers. When they're talking about this treaty, every article mentioned about Ukraine and about Russia. So it means that Russian world, Russian interests in world. Why to ignore the country which is absolutely clear part of the deal? Please, in world, don't follow exclusive policy, but uh, follow involving policy, and European Union will uh, be in glory. Celestine Bowen? 
Um, I mean, I, I'm curious to hear because I actually agree. It's hard to kind of listen to both sides of the argument at the same time. And, and the, there is a Russian side, and I don't understand the Russian justification for uh, cutting those uh, Ukrainian exports. Why cut off Ukrainian chocolate? Why bring another $8 billion hole to the Ukrainian market, uh, to the economy at a time like this? Uh, it seems to me bullying, but I'm willing to listen to an explanation. What, what's the point of that? Was that needed in order to bring this result around to where it was satisfactory for Moscow? I mean, uh, tell me. Sergey Markov? Uh, well, let's at least, yes, let's explain. It's, it's, very, it's very easy. According uh, uh, to this uh, uh, treaty with the European Union, uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, economic t uh, territory uh, will be uh, open for the goods from European Union. So as a result, uh, if we Russia doing nothing, all these goods will go without, uh, in fact, without uh, almost without real custom uh, to the uh, Russian territory. And of course, and of course, uh, Russian economy will be in big trouble because we want uh, to uh, protect our uh, economic zone, economic uh, uh, territory. And uh, uh, that's why we will have to protect ourselves from those goods. But uh, they can go only with, not, uh, with Germany, for example, or France, or um, uh, Czech uh, uh, trademark. But, uh, for example, the Škoda uh, car automobile, which have been produced, in fact, uh, uh, in uh, Czech Republic, can go to the Ukrainian territory. Ukraine just... Sergey Markov, let, let me give you Sergey Markov. Let me give you a concrete Sergey Markov, a concrete example. Ukraine pays four hundred and ten dollars per thousand cubic meters of natural gas. Belarus, much more compliant when it comes to Moscow, they pay one hundred and seventy-five. Can we now expect that those natural gas rates to Ukraine will go down on the part of Russia? No. No, it's very, it's very big mistake of European politicians uh, to think that uh, Russia want to buy something from Ukraine. No, uh, uh, Ukraine will get a uh, diminishing of the gas price if Ukraine will join custom union, because according to the custom union rules, uh, all enterprises, which is part of the zone, should uh, uh, get uh, gas on the uh, same price. Uh, uh, but if uh, uh, Ukraine will not join this semi-colonial treaty with European Union. As a result, Ukraine will not get problems from those treaty. And All right, as Sergei, result, Sergei I'm going to have to interrupt you because we'll we have, have to take... opportunity we have to, to be re-elected. We have to take a quick break. We'll talk about that, as you put it, semi-colonial treaty when we get back. Stay with us. You're watching the France Vanquette debate.